and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to nine ninety nine using the code Oxygen Addict. We're also brought to you by FueledByCake.com. That would be my charity cake recipe book, raising £15,000 for loads of charities. And we're also brought to you by TeamOxygenAddict.com Triathlon Coaching. Training plans, coaching support from Rob Wilby, monthly video coaching calls and a private Facebook group for you and your teammates. And official coaching partner to the Outlaw series as well. I'm very proud to say that. I love that, Hells. I can't wait to go back there next year. Um, and we had, actually, we had loads of nice comments about the interview with Ian, the race director from the Outlaw, last week. And three separate people, I love this, Hells, three separate people messaged on Facebook to say, I listened to your interview with Ian, and then I listened to you going on about do something next year, and I've entered the Outlaw. And I was like, how awesome is that? That's really, that's really just good. like I was hovering about what to do and I've entered it. That's great. Yeah, that it's really good. We've moved people off the fence. Moving people well, off the fence is 2014 hells. That's what our tagline should well, be. Well, so another person, Lawrence, got in touch with us, Rob, and Lawrence said about your sitting on the fence, hit enter. He said, yep, I've now signed up for my first ever try training camp in Mallorca. Not on the fence anymore. Nice. Oh, you're never going to regret signing up for training camp, that's for sure. Get out of the, the British winter and get over into the sunshine. Love it. Yeah, so well done, Lawrence. Nice well, one. Well done. Right, I'm going to kick off the show today, Hells, with a big thank you to everyone who's left a review of the show on iTunes. So we've got a bit of a, I'm going to do a bit of a competition, Hells. Until the end of January, anyone that reviews the show on iTunes and then posts a screenshot of their review to the thread that I'm going to start in the Oxygen Addict Triathlon community group on Facebook. You're going to get entered into a prize draw. And the prize of this, Hells, is super awesome. You know, my favorite bike brand, Cervelo. Yes. So they've just released a book called To Make Athletes Faster by Anna DePico, which is this beautiful kind of coffee table book that Anna is Phil White, the founder of... Um, the founder of Cervelo's uh, partner or wife, I'm not sure which one, she's written the book and tells the story of their, all the way from the startup, all the way through to the Cervelo that we know today. Loads of amazing photos back from the early days and then loads of sort of beautiful photographs of bikes in there as well. So it's an amazing book. So you get entered into a prize draw to win the copy of that. So if you're not already a member, Join the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Community Facebook page and just go and leave us an honest review on iTunes. Um, we are on a mission, Hells, to try and get 200 five-star reviews on iTunes. We're at about 111, I think, at the moment. So let's see how many how many reviews we can get on iTunes. Um, maybe by the end of January. I wonder if we could get to 200 by the end of January. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Wow. Yeah, it does. Anything's possible, Rob, isn't it? Anything is possible. And especially at this time of year i mean come on it's dark what else are you going to do go to exactly itunes and dope. leave a review <laughs> so two reviews we've had this week first up t crossland says helen and rob are clearly very passionate about endurance sports this is a very enjoyable and insightful podcast totally recommend and 28 paddy not not his or her real name i assume says great podcast to listen to while on the turbo some great interviews training advice and just generally easy listening so thanks very much to you two for leaving reviews if you want to hear your review read out on the show leave us a, a review on itunes that'd be awesome we'd really appreciate it it really helps us move up the rankings on itunes and guess what hell's Oh, I'm excited about this. Cool. We only went and got ranked number one in iTunes for Triathlon Podcast this week. How cool is that? It's just a bit mental. <laughs> you it don't like mad. thinking of this anything other than you and me just having a chat over Skype, do you? Oh, you sometimes I think I say too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not joking. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. All right. So let's kick off today's show. We haven't got any results this week. We've not managed to find any results out there, have we? Because it's the deepest, darkest depths of December, but we have found some news. We have found some news indeed, Rob. And um, so this is going to be sponsored by our friends at Precision Hydration um, because 
PH athlete Sarah Lewis has been named on the BMC Vifit team for next season. So she joins fellow Brits Will Clark and Emma Pallant. I think this is great it's news for her, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic because she's such an incredible athlete, and we've talked about her a lot over the past couple of seasons with some of her brilliant results. Was so it, then, was it Bahrain just the other week? Was she chasing down Holly Lawrence on the run? Yeah, I'm right in thinking that, aren't I? Yeah, so she's yeah. she's real, she's real one to watch. And I think BMC have done a they've done themselves a great job there getting hold of her when she's on the rise, definitely. And she says that she is going to be stepping up to the Ironman distance um, next year. So that's exciting. She says, my goal yeah. for next year will be to podium and win major 70.3 races throughout the season. And I'll also be looking to step up to the Ironman distance. I'll therefore be aiming to qualify for Kona in one of my first races, setting myself up for a top five Kona campaign. Top stuff. And she's got the uh, got the guys from Precision Hydration behind her as well, which is going to help in that exercising in the heat, isn't it, for sure? Exactly. So that team for BMC uh, Viper is Will Clark, Pablo de Pena Gonzalez, who we have mentioned a lot as well mm. on the show, Manuel Kung, uh, Chris Lefferman, Sarah Lewis, Patrick Nielsen, Emma Pallant, and then another new athlete uh, is Chelsea Riley Sodaro from the USA. He was a very, 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 very good track athlete mm. before it, switching. It's interesting how many how many of the really good track runners are switching over into triathlon now, isn't it? Seeing the light. They've seen the light, Hells. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so other news we've seen and... Do you know what? This this one really raised my eyebrows when I read this one. The the team for the World Class Performance Programme for British Triathlon has been announced for 2019. And a couple of amazing names have been listed um, for for guides for the paratriathletes, haven't they? Yep. Um, so Tim Don is on that list. Mark Buckingham. Um, who has actually been doing He's guiding been doing this it, season. Yeah. yeah, he guided Dave Ellis um, this season. And then Nikki Bartlett as well has been named on that 2019 um, World Class Performance Programme. Um, and we will be hearing from Nikki shortly and we talk a little bit uh, about that and, and what it all involved in terms of actually the testing and, and how they sort of whittled it down and, and then what happens from here on towards Tokyo 2020 um, an L20 man as well who was the fastest age group athlete at 7.3 Weymouth this year and Luke Pollard is in that gang of what well, I think seven of them Nikki says yeah cool so shall we jump over and, uh, and hear that interview with Nikki now yes let's do it here we go Nikki Bartlett, for the final time in 2018, hello and welcome back on to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast. We feel like we haven't spoken for ages. You've got loads of news. Yeah, no, we haven't spoken for ages. Well, I feel like I've been a bit of a couch potato with rehabbing my foot, so I haven't had much, too much um, information to share. <laughs> so what happened? Right, we, we, we're going to come on to... Um, I feel we should start actually with the more exciting news. I mean, the foot's very exciting and that's quite important. But the more yep. exciting news um, involves the uh, paratri and talk us through that. Yeah, so uh, a um, fantastic opportunity came up to be a uh, race guide for the visually impaired athletes, of which there's Alison Patrick and Melissa Reed. Um, and on, on, the, on the men's side, there's Dave Ellis. And the opportunity came up a few months ago and applied, and we started trials in beginning of October. Um, and then we had the final round of trials well, about probably about six weeks ago, maybe, maybe five, six weeks ago. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so they selected a group. They've actually gone for a group of seven, so uh, four guys, four girls, uh, three girls, sorry. Um, and, yeah, we'll be, we'll be race guides and training guides uh, for the athletes to hopefully achieve their dreams and goals in 2019 and 2020. Now, there was a search a couple of years ago for yeah. this, wasn't there, for Rio? Yeah, yeah, there was. Did, yeah. did anything like it cross your mind then? Uh, not particularly, um, mainly because I was kind of in that point in my life where I'd, 
I don't know. I, I don't think I fully believed I was good enough to be one of those athletes. Um, it was at a point where I was kind of still working and um, at the point where I was kind of, shall I go from age group to pro? I was a bit in dilemma. Didn't, didn't really, wasn't fully confident in taking that jump. Um, but yeah, so, so when it came up this time, I was like, I definitely really, really believe I'd be um, a great race guide for one of the athletes. Um, what, yeah. what did the testing actually involve? Um, I'm not allowed. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to go too much into detail. I think I've got my my hand bitten off. But um, there was a couple of what bike tests, um, and uh, it was quite full on. The first trial was really full on two days of um, just like group tasks, um, not so much interviews, but definitely opportunities to talk with the psychologists. Um, and the coaches and practitioners, um, just because there's so many more aspects than just testing. And yeah, so and then we had a, a, a 750 meter time trial in the pool, and those tests came at really like um, <laughs> really difficult points of of my end of season, and a couple of weeks after I'm on Wales, so I had to be like I had to keep doing some kind of training to tick over. Um, but I was still extremely tired from those races. Uh, so yeah, those were the that was the first round of trials. So those were two days, um, and I think seventy people applied and thirty people got shortlisted. Um, so there was a lot of interest in the roles, um, and then they shortlisted again to the final trials, of which I think um, was it two days or one day. Uh, I think it's two days, and um, yeah, that was again just more in depth conversations with the practitioners. Um, no more real physical testing. Um, but yeah, lots of opportunities to discuss and make sure they get the right the right guides on board. Did you have to have a go um, on piloting the tandems? Yeah, the tandem's amazing. Obviously, I, I love riding bikes and I love riding bikes fast. So when you get on a tandem, it's unreal. Like, it's brilliant. Um, it's hilarious when you first push off because you didn't realise how unstable, not unstable, but obviously, you know, there's two of you. There's not just push off and you know, communication is so key with a tandem. Like, I've been going out on the ride with Bex, which has been brilliant because we don't ever really ride together because there's quite a difference of speed. So um, it's a it's really nice opportunity to go out on the tandem with each other and be able to cycle with each other. Um, I don't think she'll mind me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> she might when she listens to it. Um, <laughs> and then, so yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, just, it's just time. It's like time on and getting used to, like, calls and, like, you know, on the stuff on the road bike and time trial bike, you just take, a, you know, you just take advantage of not having to communicate that with anyone else. You just do it. Um, just stuff like, yeah, when you push off, you can't just like freewheel and clip in with the other foot. You've got to actually get the momentum going and kind of naturally clip in as you're going along. Um, but yeah, the, the tandem's brilliant. I love it. I can't wait to see how fast we can get that going. <laughs> and how have you found um the like being tethered and and running with someone well um for me that it's kind of been a gradual process of me wanting to do the role in that um alison i know i've known jack allison's now husband oh god since i started in the sport um who's actually bex's very first athlete she used to coach so we've known him for a long time and they moved up to scotland because bex coaches allison and um, we've been doing little bits and pieces together in the pool and um, I, haven't act- I hadn't actually been on the tandem but when they go out on the tandem I'll go out on my road bike or try and trial bike with them um, so I've kind of like slowly but surely been introduced to not introduced to the role but had opportunities to, to have a go um, and it's brilliant <clears throat> I think it's an amazing opportunity and a massive privilege to be able to to, to uh, you know try and get the athletes guy- uh, be a guide and um, try and get their goals and everything they've always dreamt of and uh, gold will be their aim in Tokyo for 2020 so if you can help you know get that then how amazing would that be um, yeah to be alongside that journey would be absolutely fantastic and do you still have to almost like be selected for Tokyo as well um, yeah, so I'll have to, I don't, I, I think it will all be based on how this year goes. Um, but yeah, there might be another kind of selection process towards the end of 
2019. I'm not too sure about that. Um, so yeah, for, for this year, I'll be Alison Patrick's guide for 2019. Um, and she won silver in Rio. So yeah, it'd be really, really cool year. I can't wait. It's going to be brilliant. <laughs> well, and um, the person who, um, and Alison won't want me to mention this, but anyway, the person who would have finished ahead of her at Rio was guided by McKelly Jones. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, so Alison, Alison's surname now, P's good before, um, if she listens to us, she might cut my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me off, great. Um, you came to our wedding. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so yeah, it's going to be a really exciting journey and um, yeah, I just can't wait. It's going to be brilliant. That's amazing. So how now, how now, how now does your season look differently next year? Um, so so uh, um start with, it depends. I'm not going to rush the foot. I'm just going to do what I need to do with the foot. But my swim and biking is probably, my swimming especially is like best shape I've been in, mainly because I've just spent so much time in the pool over the last month. You're now a fish, Nikki. You're a proud fish. I, uh, I'm never going to be a fish in the pool, but... <laughs> I am about, like, we did a speed set today and I'm probably about five seconds quicker over some 75 metres in the pool than this time last year, so that's, that's exciting. That's good. Uh, yeah, I think with, with swimming, I mean, people will beat around the bush, but it's just time in the pool and consistency and doing the right sessions. There's, you know, you've got to be in the pool a lot, um, but not just going to the pool with, with no structure. For all your sessions to be structured and and tailored towards the distance you're going for, but it is just time and time in form. And then when I came back from my foot um, injection, I was literally only allowed to swim for like two weeks. And so I had my four weeks completely off because, you know, they said after the MRI scan, they were like, oh, well, if you just stop, you know, it's, take your season break for four weeks, it should just, the inflammation should go. Um, so I had my four weeks off and then went back to see a sports tendon doctor in London and he was like, yeah, no, it's not gone. It's not gone one bit, really. So I had to have an injection. Um, and then I had to have three to four days bed rest, which for me is an absolute nightmare. I mean, by bed rest, I mean, they said just keep off the foot as much as possible, just go to the toilet, and that's it. Wow. And I was like, oh, my God, like, it's my worst nightmare. I like, can't even do it for, like, a couple of hours, so, like, so four days of it. So I had my season break, and then this. So I was, like, five weeks, and I was like, I need to, like, spend my energy. Like, that's just, like, do whatever you can and just, go and tie yourself out <laughs> I was just like living in the pool um I think I did like 14 hours um over one week yeah for a couple of weeks so yeah I was racking up quite a lot of swim swim miles um so yeah it just kind of brought my stroke on a lot and because I wasn't for for a non-swimmer I don't know if anyone can relate this to for an answer, as soon as I'm in a full swim bike run program my swim's always always the one which um kind of falls not falls off but it, when I'm tired the quality just goes so I haven't been tired from running or biking so my, I've been able to just solely focus on my swim which has been great and have you been able to sort of maintain those like those stroke improvements because you're saying you know when you do get tired like that is the first thing that sort of goes but now do you feel that it, it almost like it doesn't go now the technique um it, I do need reminders, um, you know, like everyone would need a reminder when they're tired in terms of technique, and, and I'm always honest with the coach, and I'm like, just tell me when I'm being a chopper and chopping at it, and sometimes I thrash my arms quite a bit, or I've got a real issue with my left hand, my left arm, my, my right arm's pretty good, but my left arm just wants to go straight through the water rather than bend and actually do anything, um, so I need reminders of that quite a lot, and kind of you know when the speed goes up to not think to thrash your arms around but actually connect with the water properly um but yeah i've been a lot less i mean i've i've been now on a heavyweights program because it's part of my rehab process and oh my god this morning i literally woke up and i was like oh god i can't get down to the toilet seat here's the doms again <laughs> um so i woke up and i was like oh and we have a speed swim like i, I say early but it's not really that early it's like half seven um, so we have a speed, speed swim, and I was like, oh, and because I'm, like, non-swimmer, I, like, use my legs quite a lot, and I was like, oh, no, like, this is going to go terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it was, a, it was a really good swim, so don't ever talk yourself up for swim sex, you don't know what's going to what's gonna come out of it. 
nice advice. Nice advice. Um, go back to the what's after Lanzarote. No, what the the, the um what? How did oh, yeah. the season look? We <laughs> a really long way around. Not, yeah, we didn't even... quite get there. <laughs> oh, God, I waffle. Sorry. Um, so yeah. So <laughs> if after all of that waffle, if my foot is great and I'm fit enough, I'll do Ironman South Africa as my first one. Um, and then Lanzarote Ironman after that. Um, if if I need more time, I'll just go to Lanzarote as my first race. I'm in no rush. Um, yeah, so the aim for those two races is to qualify for Kona. Um, so if anyone's unaware that the systems change and how to qualify now, so in simple terms, you win and you're in, or you go to a continental championship race and it's top two, but it gets a bit more... It gets a bit more complicated. I'm not really don't really understand the floating slots, but it looks like no females get it anyway. So, um, so constant. So, say someone races and wins, but they've already qualified Kona, it will roll down to second place. Um, so there's a bit more added bonuses in that respect, but you know, you just got to go and try and win a race. And I haven't actually won a race yet, so I've got five podiums this year. So, I need to actually go and try and win one next year to qualify. <laughs> And when, how does the, how does the work with um, British Para Triathlon fit in with trying to qualify for Kona? Yeah, so it's, they're, they're, they're great and they're, they're supporting my ambitions. I mean, um, one of the race guides on the male side is Tim Don. So he's still got ambitions to qualify for Kona and race at Kona. So we've kind of prioritised the beginning of the year for me to try and qualify. Um, and the key races... Uh, for the guiding would be the Tokyo Test event in August and the World Champs in August and one other race because there's obviously a qualifying process to qualify for Tokyo. So there's three, there's going to be three key races that I need to be um, in very good shape for next year. So we're going to, and we're going to target early races. So if I can get to South Africa, that'd be ideal. Um, So yeah. Is that's kind of where my season will shape around. And I re- there's some races I really want to do. I really want to do Stacks again because I love that race and I've done it every year since it's been going. So I'd really like to do that one. Um, but yeah, July and August uh, will definitely be focused on the guiding role. Um, yeah. Does it add for you, does 2019, like it just sounds really exciting because you've got both those goals going on rather than yeah. just this sort of almost like a treadmill of just trying to get to Kona you know yeah no I'm like some I don't know in life sometimes you don't know how excited you are about rolling to in it and you're doing it and all part of it um so when I applied for a role I really didn't really fully understand how much I wanted the role and so I started the trials and I was like well I'm very very excited about this opportunity um so yeah I'm and I'm very excited about trying to qualify for Kona as well. And so, yeah, I'm going into next year with a lot of excitement. I just want to get cracking racing, but obviously it's only December. And my coach, Rob, is being uh, very strict in that note. We're still just doing 15 to 18 hours a week and no mileage and high high intensity is kind of where we're at at the moment. So, um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm buzzing about next season. Just want to get going, but yeah, it's it's a long way off, and you've got to do everything right to get to make sure you don't rush it, and you're actually peaking for the right races. Because if I'm starting in April uh, to be in good shape, and I'm you know continuing on to October, that's a long period of time to, to be in good shape for. Um, so yeah, I've got to just make sure I don't muck that up, uh, and that can be often mucked up at this time of year if you just go too hard too soon. Is Tim Don now then one of your training partners, Nikki? <laughs> he actually lives down the road from us. I'm obviously not going to say where we are, where we live, but <laughs> it's, it's it's a small world. Um, so I don't. No, I haven't actually trained with Tim yet, but but hopefully we'll do some tandem rides together. Um, and yeah, uh, I went out with um, Matt Bot- Bottrell, and the, they're trying to get a, a nice community squad, not squad, but obviously Matt coaches a lot of athletes around here, so it's Chris Hines. So we're trying to get some Wednesday and Saturday group rides up, of which we, we did one on Saturday uh, two weeks ago. And it was like two and a half hours with a lot of it tempo. And I was like, I'm finding it difficult to even talk. <laughs> it made two and a half hours go very quickly and I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, it's such a nice group of athletes around here uh, to train with. 
how are you finding Loughborough life? Because obviously before that you were based um, for up in Scotland, weren't you? Yes, uh, yeah, love it. So we've been here since August. Um, so I guess over the last two months really is the first time I've been out exploring and seeing what's around. And yeah, we really love it here. The, the university setup is brilliant. Um, the gym is just mental. It's never quiet, except on a Sunday afternoon. So, um, and like, you've got like 15 watt bikes, you've got Wahoo kickers with the TV screens all set up and the gym is like, I don't even know how many squat racks. There must be at least 10 squat racks in there, which always have people on. Um, so yeah, the gym's always got very good atmosphere and, um, the cycling is brilliant. And where we live, we're just onto the, the trail pass, which you can run to the outwards, Brecon Hill, uh, Bradgate Park, and kind of go through parks and trail running for a good couple of hours without hitting any traffic, which is really nice. Um, so, yeah, I didn't realize quite how good it would be until we moved here. And I was like, wow, this is pretty epic. So, um, yeah, we love it. Hopefully, looking to buy next year here. So, get settled in. That's amazing. Well, yeah, yeah, no, all good. You sound, you sound very, very happy. Yeah, all good, and just yeah, kind of want to get cracking, but don't want to get cracking too soon. <laughs> and, and how does Christmas look, Nikki? Uh, so we're going to Bex's parents this Christmas, and then my parents for New Year. Nice. Um, my parents got a new puppy, and Titch met the puppy last week, and Titch thinks she, she's a human, and she doesn't really like dogs, so she's a bit like, oh my god, there's a hyper dog all over me. What's going on? <laughs> so yeah it's the human dogs gonna have to get used to to little puppy Ted and will you be training on Christmas day um yeah I well I love training and exercise and so I'll definitely be doing something just because it's part of my daily routine and I love it last Christmas I actually did an hour test on the bike <laughs> as you do but I happy, actually happy Christmas to yourself <laughs> happy Christmas set an alarm <laughs> at 5am so you're done yeah, no, so I set, well, my family tends to get up pretty late. I don't think they're up until about 10 a.m. So so got in this hour test, 90 minutes of uh, training and all done before anyone's awake. So, yeah, winning. Happy um, so yeah, I might do something similar this year because it gets some very good quality training done in a very short space of time. Um, but I've just done an FTP test, actually, so maybe I'll let myself off. And and were you happy with the uh, results? Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, managed to get a PB, so very, very weirdly got a PB, so I don't really know how that happens, but yeah, uh, in a good place. So yeah, looking forward to next season. I love this. Nikki, thank you so much for all of the regular updates across 2018. It's been so awesome to, to follow it all. Yeah, hopefully there'll be a good journey to follow with um, Power Guiding Roll and getting Alison that gold medal at Tokyo but yeah I've got to go through 2019 first and reach those goals and maybe reselection at the end of the year so we'll see so it's it looks... great to hear go on sorry Rob I was just gonna say it looks like Tim Dunn's back over in the UK training out of Loughborough again then yes that's what that's what it seems doesn't it yeah yep, living down the down the road from um from Nikki and Bex what an incredible sort of arc his career's had hasn't it coming back around to the point where would that be his fourth olympics if he goes again Has so he been, he's been to two or three i'm trying to scratch my head now so he didn't make london did he no so before london uh it would have been 2008 would have been beijing. beijing he was there before beijing would have been athens he was there and sydney 2000 i don't know whether he was there um, it's a very good question. But it would be would be pretty amazing to make another Olympics, wouldn't it? And and kind of go all the way to long distance racing, break the official Ironman world record, come back from that horrendous crash, go to the Olympics again. That's unreal. Going to the Paralympics, yeah. He he yeah. did he did go to the um he did go to Sydney two thousand and right. he was tenth. Wow. And it's. Yeah, it would it would be incredible. And I mentioned in the little chat there with Nikki that McKelly Jones yeah. was guide to I can't remember the name of the athlete, and I should uh, find that out right now. But McKelly Jones guided the um, the athlete to gold at Rio 2016 in the Paralympics. It's really cool how that comes around, isn't it? And and I think it yeah. speaks to the quality of athlete that they need. You know, they need Olympians to guide them. 
They they need the the fastest. Yeah, yeah. they need the fastest athletes. Yeah, that's um, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's just come. It's just come on such a long way. I mm. remember spending um, time with again with Alison, who uh, Nikki mentions, who she's going to be working with. Um, so Alison and um, and her guide at the time a couple of a couple of seasons ago went to Loughborough. Okay. And uh, it was just it was so interesting and just seeing actually how the guide process sort of happens and and being tethered and and the communication that is needed is you just don't think about it and Nikki said you know it's something that if she goes out on her bike normally she wouldn't you just clip in you go but if you're acting as a pilot for someone on a bike and you're guiding someone um because you know they can't see um you're the way that you communicate with that athlete has to be bang on 100 yeah. percent good or yeah. else you're going to make mistakes wow well, it'd be interesting to watch how that one plays out, won't it? Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So, yeah, mixing that, so trying to get a medal, get gold at Tokyo 2020 in the Paralympics with trying to qualify for Kona as well. Good. It sure is. And we'll just give a shout out again there to sponsors of that section, Precision Hydration. So you'll have heard me speak on previous podcasts and say, look, you can take the online sweat test and get a feel for whether you're a particularly salty sweater or heavy sweater. And if you're getting pointed in that direction, it's a really good idea to go along and have your sweat tested in person and find out exactly what sort of concentration your sweat is, exactly the volume of sweat that you're likely to use in an hour. And that can form a really valuable part of a strategy for people who are either racing in the heat, who know they have problems with losing a lot of electrolytes. And that's typically people who feel very sick at the end of either long races or and hot races and the chance to get tested in person doesn't come along that often so dave's dropped me an email from ph.com to say they're putting on a hydration workshop in chester at a place called pro physio it's going to be on january the 26th so they're doing a hydration workshop at 5 p.m and there's going to be discounted sweat testing available from 9 a.m to 4 p.m and that, again, is on the 26th of January in Chester at Pro Physio. So there's going to be a link in the show notes today and then every show notes leading up to that happening. So you can click on that and get the details and book yourself in if you want to go along and actually get your sweat tested. I've had it done. Hells, you've had it done as well, haven't you? Yep. A couple of seasons ago, really simple, pain-free, really useful thing to go and get done. Um, and remember, you can get a free box or tube of pH worth up to nine ninety nine using the code OxygenAddict at PrecisionHydration.com. Awesome stuff. All right, then tell us, please, about today's interview of the week, Helen. So this interview of the week, Rob, is with Xterra, multiple Xterra world champion Leslie Patterson and her husband, Simon Marshall. Uh, they are over in sunny San Diego. And together, they, they're they very, very funny. But apart from being very, very funny, they're very, very um, intelligent people. Uh, they have written uh, the book called The Brave Athlete Calm the... Rob, you're going to have to put a bleeper in if you, if you want, or you're going to have to put an exclamation mark. Just say F, shall we? Calm the F down. Yeah, I think it does come out once in the um, in the interview uh, and rise to the occasion. So go and check out that book. If you haven't read it before, it is it's a great book. I ordered it like, I don't know, last year or whatever, whenever it came out. And um, I really, really enjoyed reading it. It's about the mental side of um, of triathlon um, and all those sort of questions that that pros ask themselves we ask ourselves you know how how do you keep going when everything is just saying just pull the plug you know those thoughts about i feel really fat um just so much stuff which if you haven't thought of these things someone that you train with will have thought about them yeah. so honestly great full of laughs and full of useful information as well so here you go here is this week's interview of the week Leslie Patterson and Simon Marshall, hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. How's it going? Hey, hello, hello. It's, hello, it's awesome. It's about 80 degrees here in San Diego, so life is good. I <laughs> know, in California, miles away from rainy Britain. <laughs> so how's planning going for the Highland Games then? Oh, good, yeah. So, uh, you know, what happened, this is our fifth year, I think, doing it, fifth year, and so 
we kind of have it down. We have a little system and, uh, yeah, you know, we don't get too anxious about it until about a week before and then we think, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. We've got 100 people descending on us and we need to figure out, yeah, how to herd cats. I did. I was looking before and I was like, Highland Gate, are they coming back to Scotland? And then I was like, oh, no. No, they're taking they're having a training camp in San Diego. Uh, is Caber Tossing going to be in it? It is actually. We we do a we actually do a Highland Games on one of the days, and uh, we do it in a park uh, in San Diego, which is rather amusing. A ton of Americans in a in a in a sort of a, a, a Mexican type uh, area in San Diego in this park, you know, tossing. Uh, stand, up stand up paddleboards. Stand up paddleboards. Cabers, yeah. And some cabers, and then. Uh, you know, pulling on big ropes and doing tug of war and all sorts of nonsense. What the um, what the heck are their faces like when you're throwing stand up paddle paddles? They get into it. Tell you what, man, they dig it. Although what's funny is that most of them, as you may know, triathletes in particular, cyclists and runners will be like this too. That their functional fitness is usually so poor that that you know they kind of uh, they they're so sore afterwards, or they're pulling a bicep because they didn't haven't tugged a rope for years. They're just doing it in this, like, kind of this little, little linear motions. So they only train in or one plane of motion, so it's quite funny. It sounds it sounds brilliant. <laughs> so uh, Leslie, let's just go back a few weeks, and um, you won again at Exeter the Exeter World Championships. Yay. Yeah, I was super stoked. Uh, I haven't won since 2012, so. And I've kind of been to hell and back in, in the last six years. So with injury and illness and, and all sorts of hoop class. So it was definitely a, a pretty special, a special day out there. Not just because I won, but because of how I felt. You know, it really was one of the most pretty perfect days for me. And the conditions were absolutely atrocious, very muddy and wet. Uh, and a lot of people were complaining and, and had tough races. But it's funny when you feel good, somehow you don't even notice the conditions. It's really quite bizarre. It's mad, isn't it? Because obviously Ironman World Championships this year had like the most perfect conditions, didn't they? Right, and then, I know yeah. it was like the opposite. Um, but you know, I think it's it's one of those things that you know when you're in the zone, you just kind of have to cope with whatever is flung your way. And I've got so much practice at that now because uh, mm-hmm. of everything that I've been through, and then obviously you know writing the book of Sai and having a, a mental game plan for every race I go into then I just feel way more prepared than everyone else. And ultimately, that's what makes you rise above. And I, and I think with Xterra, because they, you know, unlike um, road triathlon, they'll, they'll rarely cancel any or, or cut short any part of it due to conditions, because that's the spirit of Xterra. So I think that, you know, when the, when the harsh conditions come, uh, you can mentally prepare for them. But for athletes, particularly kind of the, the sort of, DNA of Leslie's athleticism is that the harder the conditions, the better for her because she's looking for opportunities to differentiate herself from the other athletes. And fitness is one way that you do that. Mental toughness is another way. So Xterra is a perfect uh, venue, really, for athletes who really feel as all they've got a mental edge they feel on other athletes. It's really good. And, you know, they say about Xterra, if it was easy, they'd call it Ironman. (laughs) And Leslie, when, when did you do your first Xterra? Yeah, it was 2000 and, uh, gosh, 2008, I think, 2007 or 2008. Um, so, yeah, you know, over over 10 years ago. Um, yeah. And was that sort of after the big, because you took like a, a really, quite a substantial break, didn't you, from, from triathlon? Hey. Yeah, I did. You know, I, I was very competitive as a junior and went through the kind of whole um, national programs and, you know, wanted to go to the Olympics and all the rest of it, but my swimming was just not good enough. And I just didn't really have the passion for that style of triathlon, for the drafting style of triathlon. And so I got very, very disillusioned and, and just pretty down on myself, if I'm honest, and, and gave up when I was about 20. And was like, I'm never going to do another triathlon as long as I live. I hate the damn sport, which is so ironic fast forward, right? You know, and uh, here I am, it's such a huge part of my life again. So I think it was more just my... Um, uh, you know my relationship with it that changed and finding the sport of Xterra which really um, you know sort of has a special place in my heart both because you're out there you're out in the elements you're out in the mountains you're out in the wilderness which is everything that I grew up with and then the spirit of it is is what best suits me you know and the people and you know it's it's not so sterile and 
um, yeah, so so when I came back to the sport the second time through, I just had a completely different approach to it. Does it surprise you a little bit that it's not really taken off that much in the UK? Yeah, it's super weird because in Europe it's huge. You know, you go to um, Xterra France and there's 2,000 competitors on the line. In fact, 2,500 competitors is as big as Ironman. Um, so I'm not sure what that's about. I think probably because there's just not many races, people haven't been exposed to it. Um, and because it, cause it's a very sort of hardy sport, you're out there in the elements. A lot of Europeans, the French, the the, the Eastern Europeans, you know, they're, they're used to being out there cross country skiing and, you know, doing lots of kind of things out in the elements. Um, you know, I, I just don't think it's in the in, in the culture in the UK, both because of the weather and then just what's available. So I think if there was more races to choose from, people would be exposed to it and, and have a crack at it, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 a real shame. I really hope they can they can build on that. I know the Brownlee brothers were looking at uh, uh, trying to sort of start the road off road series at one point. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still into that. So fingers crossed that that maybe happens. Wow, it just it just seems that like there's there's so much um, sort of good countryside and and good areas that you could do it, but yeah, yep. I don't know. Well, you know, Xterra is an odd one because if you look at how you're going to draw in your market, a lot of uh, race directors are looking at triathletes. And triathletes are a funny breed, you know. Uh, they get into the sport for, for many different reasons, but primarily that sort of uh, status. It's very status-driven, uh, and that's why everything has moved towards Ironman now. It's, it's that big badge of, look at me, I've done an Ironman. And so I don't think the status of Xterra holds the same you know, it holds the same impact that something that Ironman does. So, and not only that, a lot of triathlete, on-road triathletes are so scared of mountain biking, um, you know, that it's very difficult to get them to cross over. So then you're looking at, you know, either uh, long-distance trail runners or mountain bikers, and that market's very small as well. So, you know, trying to draw, who are you trying to draw upon to, to build the, you know, to build the sport? It's, it's a real challenge. How did you go about developing your mountain bike skills? Yeah, it was uh, baptism of fire. Uh, I had I had some some close friends here in San Diego that were mountain bikers, and uh, they kind of took me out, and it was oh my god, it was so scary at first. Um, <laughs> they they used to call me their rag doll because they would look behind them, see me coming down these descents, and my hair's everywhere, I'm bouncing around, falling off. Um, you know, so I, I was lucky. I had some, some really cool people that, that really kind of held my hand through it. Cause that's what you need. I mean, you need some, you need people that are not going to judge you, that are going to take you out on easier trails at first, get you comfortable with all that sort of stuff and then build you up from there. And unfortunately, the mountain biking sort of community and culture is one of, yeah, man, let's go off this drop off and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and that is so scary and off-putting for most. Uh, for most athletes that they just think oh I don't even want to do that so um, you know there's a lot certainly here in San Diego now there's a lot of things like beginners clinics and you know skills training and all this kind of stuff to get people into the sport to begin with um, so you know I, I was definitely lucky to have access to all of that I've had a question from uh, a listener called Fran White and she says so she's entered Exterra Belgium for next year it's going to be her first ever cross try she says, I'm an experienced mountain biker. I've completed various triathlons of all distances. Um, but what specific training should I do for Xterra that is different to normal yep. tri training? A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of strength work. So a lot of work in the gym, uh, functional strength work so that you have muscle durability and you have a very dynamic motion pattern. So that you're economical working in lots of different planes of motion because in Xterra, of course, you're in and out of rocks and roots and up hills and down hills. So you, you need to be able, you, your musculature needs to be able to cope with that. So that's one point. Second point is a lot of hill training. Um, so I do a lot of, certainly on the bike, what we call torque training. And torque training is very, very low cadence climbing on the bike. I'm talking like 45 RPMs. So it's almost like weight training on a bike. Wow. And that what that does is it develops maximum muscle recruitment of the muscle fiber bed. And it makes your muscles very, very durable because in Xterra, 
you're having to deal with a lot of um, uh, changes in terrain, a lot of high torquey, uh, torquey work. And then, of course, you have to have the strength to be able to get off that kind of stuff on the bike and then, and then run effectively. So I'll do a lot of things like plyometrics off the bike. So I'll do like a, a bike workout where I'm doing the torque training and get off and do a lot of plyometrics or stair workouts, uh, hopping, jumping, skipping, a lot of hill bounds. Again, everything in Xterra has a foundation of strength. So if you can build the strength first and then put the speed on to that, that's going to get you your best results in Xterra. So, I don't know, let's say if you had 10 hours a week for training, yep. would you divide it? in a similar way that you might do for a normal triathlon? It, you would, just with a different emphasis. So i definitely be spending a couple of those hours in the gym at this time of year specifically, obviously phasing your training. But two hours in the gym, one lifting heavy and one lifting functional. And then I would be getting sort of a two structured swim, bike and run workouts in. Um, you know, a, a, on the bike side again, a lot of hills, a lot of the torque stuff I'm talking about. A, and then on the run, I'd be doing both of those off the bike if you can, at least one of them. Um, and doing a, hill repeats off the bike as one of the workouts. A, and then sort of um, a, potentially some plyo work a, off the bike a, on the other workout. So a, there's lots of kind of cool ways to kind of mix it up. Uh, for instance, I'll do the functional strength work I'm talking about. I'll do that off the bike sometimes. So it's almost like a run session, but it's not. Uh, it's getting a, a stimulus that's slightly different, but it's still working on the functioning of your body and a sort of running motion. Um, so, so yeah, so while the makeup can be similar, uh, the emphasis is just going to be different for Xterra. Simon, are you, are you into the mountain biking side of things as well in the Xterra? Um, well, I come from a cycling, road cycling background. That's how I met Leslie, actually. Um, and then mountain biking, just as most roadies also do a little bit of mountain biking. But not, I was never into triathlon until I met Leslie and sort of got, uh, dragged kicking and screaming into the neurotic world of triathlon. And then actually fell in love with it, really, because um, of one, it's, you know, it's much more all over body conditioning. So it's great training that, that the cycling, that cycling can't provide. And then the Xterra part, um, I've enjoyed the community is very different. It's got a, it's got a bit of a feel like mountain biking, uh, had, uh, sort of 10 years ago or fell running. It's sort of, you're all in this together. It's, it's you against the environment versus you against, you now I'm looking at my competitors eyeing them up. It's not, it's not like that. And that where road triathlon is and road racing is and so on. So it's a really lovely community that I found that transitioning as a cyclist, it was hard because I, you know, like most cyclists, I swim like a seahorse, you know, my legs. And, up and uh, stuff are kind of heavy and dense <laughs> so they're kind of toe dragger but uh, again uh, lots of um, converting some of the functional strength and stuff into uh, into multi-sport training really did help and i and i really do enjoy it i mean um, i don't do uh, the distances that leslie does but i'm sort of a you know sprint distance olympic distance athlete and i really enjoy it he just he just doesn't enjoy racing here in San Diego because he, he gets called Leslie's husband. So I've, got, I've, I've lost my own identity. I'm no longer. No, they never, oh, is this is Leslie's husband coming across the line? Like, great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. Like, if you cover someone at work or whatever, they're like, oh yeah, this is uh, this is you know X's replacement. You're like, no, I'm I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a. I don't mind. You know, people. It's funny because one. This notion of being chicked in sport as a man being overtaken by one people get many men that we know here do sort of get they still find it a little bit alarming i've never really understood that well they're fitter stronger do more training than you to so suck it up they're a better athlete right so i've never really uh, uh found that a struggle but it's nice when occasionally leslie and i have done the same race uh and those rare conditions that we happen to be on the same part of the course at the same time, usually there's this one lap up. <laughs> uh, we've kind of had a little high five, a little laugh. So that's kind of nice when you actually see each other in a race. But uh, for the most part, I'm playing um, Sherpa in my team shit, uh, which is support husbands in training. We have a group of men who are all his wives and girlfriends and partners are much faster than us. So we kind of are, are our Sherpas for most of the time. Leslie, if uh, I've read somewhere that you can be a bit of a bitch before racing, <laughs> is is Simon is, can, does Simon have a bit of a, a bitchy edge before racing? Oh no, he's the opposite. He's like uh, he gets kind of dithering and sort of like he just gets distracted and all over the place. So he's he's kind of you know I just get 
super sort of intense and focused and he goes the other way he gets like distracted and oh um and so we're kind of the opposite but luckily we don't often race together at the same time and even if we are racing it he knows it's my job and it's his hobby so he's you know super supportive of that but you know it's funny you know we call obviously in the book that that we wrote uh, we talk about developing an alter ego and so uh, most people now in the sport know that I have this alter ego that I train and race under called Paddy McGinty uh, and Paddy is a, a, an Irish MMA fighter I think Conor McGregor and so you know when, whenever I kind of have that face on me which is like a death stare they're like oh Paddy's out Paddy's out um, so you know I'll be on the race course and people are shouting you know shouting go Paddy go Paddy so you know, luckily, I think people know that, and and, it, and it's kind of what we discussed about just before we, you know, we started on this podcast about Nicholas Spurig. You know, I think that that when you are racing and when you are training and it is your job, you have a persona, or most people have a persona that they feel, you know, helps them get into that space where they can compete and perform at that level. Um, but unfortunately, it's sort of a weird thing where we do a lot of training with amateur athletes where it's a hobby. So they don't necessarily always understand that, you know, this is your job. This is how you make your paycheck. And, you know, similarly, I would not walk into an office and come and interrupt you in the middle of a conference call and be like, hey, buddy, what's up? Yeah, man. How's your intervals going? Woo-hoo! You know, so <clears throat> I think it's just sometimes just that lack of understanding. Um, but but then, you know, it, it you know, it's a small price to pay, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and Simon, how do you deal with um, with Leslie in the few days before a race? I mean that in a nice yeah, way. That delicate. sounds like a, how do you deal with that? But I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, rather delicately. No, I think that you you sort of, um, well, and you know, this isn't just something to deal with it. We both sort of talked about how you curate and create this character because it helps her, her set aside the temperament or the characteristics in her personality that aren't conducive to you know, uh, running and swimming and biking as fast as you can with an attitude, right? And a pain tolerance and so on. So um, the, the thing is for Leslie, I think, is recognizing that she needs this character and whatever, whatever, you know, doesn't have to have a name, but just you have to like get your game face on. And then seeing that that also, rec- there's a transition where she stepped out of being, you know, the, Les- the little Leslie that I know, which is usually the sort of the quite, um, uh, shy and retiring and meek and, and uh, you know, uh, considerate. And she switches to this other persona. So I know that I can't, you can't expect, as, as anybody who has a partner who races, you know, the morning of a race and you want them to be still the person that you know as your wife, boyfriend, whatever, uh, because they're kind of, they're in there, adrenaline's flying, cortisol's raging, you know, they're, they're, they're ready to go into a, to a fight or flight battle. And l- at least that's what their brain is telling them. So you can't expect them to be you know, all have all of the same characteristics. So it's it's one of these things that we've, we've learned. The big challenge has been having her transition out of that when training is finished or hard training is finished or racing is over. Um, and so, because I don't want to, you know, be in a relationship with an Irish MMA fighter. <laughs> um, so, uh, and so it's sort of, she does, you know, we have a little, you know, we have, you know, she comes up, we have got these three flights of stairs to get to our living room or to get to our house. And um, so, you know, she kind of uses those stairs as this little transition to take off that persona and come back to the world as little Leslie. So, so that, that works. And I just know what to expect, but it, it what's interesting is when we help athletes develop their, their alter egos, um, we don't often think about the people around them, the, you know, the role of your partner or your kids are also sort of seeing you in this different way. And you have to be quite selfish and self-centered to get to get your head into the space, the race as well. So managing the dynamic between within family groups is also part of the challenge. And I've got personal <laughs> first hand experience, not just professional experience, but, but obviously personal experience of that as well. So that's quite uh, we've got lots of funny stories about how we managed or not managed to do that over the years. So what, what tips then for uh, developing an alter ego? How, how do you make or how do you develop a an alter ego? Yeah, so, you know, interestingly, my background is actually in acting. So I've got a graduate degree, an undergraduate degree in, in drama. So I was used to creating characters. And, and, and how I did that was you use points of inspiration to help you form that character. So for me, it's, it's finding a, a people or environments that... Um, a, 
are, are most like the, the type of person or uh, have the types of traits that you feel you need to race. Um, so looking at videos, uh, looking at films, like films are a really good one, looking at characters and films, uh, and then looking at the traits that they have, the, the body language, the way that they speak, the way that they move, and starting to develop some of those little traits, um, whether it's, you know, a posture thing, how you hold your hands, how you look at things, um, and uh, and you kind of develop the character like that and then uh, having sort of i have a lot of pictures i watch little videos like before worlds there was a specific uh, a video of conor mcgregor that i watched with a piece of music that just really inspired me um and the way that he walked and, and spoke and, and all the rest of it I, you know that's kind of how i walked to the start line um and then also having um uh, some costume right we all put on our, you know, our training outfits, our race outfits, and seeing that as a transition point. Uh, so there's lots of different ways. And in fact, in our book, we have a little kind of a kit, uh, uh, alter ego kit that you go through, um, all the steps to help you develop your own one. And has Paddy McGinty changed over the past few years? Yeah, so I think, I think, um, gosh, good question. I think... Um, it's a lot more refined. So I have a couple of movements, a couple of thoughts and things that uh, that that help me get into Paddy. And um, it's it's I would say in terms of how it's changed, it's more about how I'm able to come in and out of that character more. I'm able to do that a lot more than I ever have. Um, so I, you know, if I feel myself in an environment where Paddy's coming out, I'm just like, okay. You know, just chill out. I, you know, I have my Leslie persona and I have my Paddy persona. So, um, just the ability to flick in and out of that, I think, has become a bit more refined. Now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Simon, what made you, or I mean, I, either of you could could answer this one, but Simon, what made you write um, the brave athletes calmly down and rise to the occasion? You can't bear yourself to say it, can you? Really? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Uh, we, we won't. Uh, we won't force it. Um, well, it's really. It was a joint effort because, and it reflects our backgrounds. So and mine, you know, my PhD is in psychology or sport and exercise psychology, and I learned as most sports psychologists do through sort of in academic departments, through textbooks, and you have some supervised you know internships and you work in the trenches with that real real people but most of your work is sort of textbook based right and so many of the techniques as when i was started out as a consultant i was finding that they either didn't work or athletes were sort of rolling their eyes at them or they just it just seemed like you could tell that they were invented by by people who are writing about it more so than doing it and then when i got a chance to peek behind the curtain by, uh, of professional sport by being, by marrying into it and again that's one of the best ways to learn about how athletes tick is marry into it um is that um i learned that you know what athletes say to you and tell you isn't always what they're actually thinking and so recognizing some of those symptoms and so and then and then trying to combine sort of the real world uh intimate thoughts of a professional athlete all the things that you're deep down scared about or worried about that you would never really admit even to some coaches but you can to your partner and then in combined with Leslie's training in drama we were able to kind of merge these two sort of one of the experiential uh with the sort of academic and um in actual fact, we found that many of the techniques, and the alter ego is a great example of that, like there is a good scientific basis of why it works. No one, that you won't find that in any sports psychology book. Uh, you find a lot of acting books, but there's some really good cognitive and neuroscientific reasons why alter ego and thinking of yourself in the third person has both a therapeutic value but also a performance enhancing value so uh, it was looking at the things that leslie did either organically or intuitively and looking at them through a scientific lens say well why there what, what sort of mechanisms or why does this why would this work and how could we tweak it to make it more consistent with what we know in the science works and then on my side it's trying things giving things a more pra you know that, that i've been sort of trained in uh giving them a more practical spin or flair to make them more digestible or manageable and even just the way that they're branded or the language that you use about those techniques so that they're more easily um uh, implemented with with real people and so that 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 the book really represents the, the interface between the two and in fact we wanted to make it so 
so uh, such emerging in fact that's partly reflected in the title and using <laughs> swear words and words that we know athletes use or sh real people use all the time uh, but um, also in the chapter title so we wanted to meet at one of the things we both wanted to do was meet athletes where they were at so rather than have a, 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 a you know a t um, chapters on stress management or pain management uh, and, and no athlete comes to you with and phrasing it in that in those ways they say look i just need to harden the f up or you know i, I feel fat i know i don't i know i know i know i shouldn't feel like that because i'm an athlete but i do you know so the the chapter titles all are the ways that the the problems uh appear in athletes heads so these are real athletes in fact all of the quotes and all the chapter headings come out of the athletes that we've coached or consulted with and then we are trying to unpack these the way that they're experienced from a more uh, evidence-based uh, uh, psychological science perspective, and then we then we look at some tools and strategies that represent that you know convergence of um, sort of uh, research and practical experience, uh, and then try and and then show case studies. So for every uh, every topic, we have a case study about how we've implemented this with a real person, a real athlete. We've changed their names to you know to protect them but uh, but it really does help so you see what it looks like and you see also in when you do that you see how things aren't always as perfect and easy as we make them out to be you know lots of techniques just don't work even though they work with some people they don't work again so how you have to tweak them so we wanted to include all of that in our book as well so people don't feel that what's wrong with me why can't i just change my negative self-talk into positive self-talk they make it sound so easy but why is it that i can't do it well there are some really good reasons why it's really difficult to do that so we we've tried to show why that is i bought it last year actually when it came out and um i i genuinely loved my commute to work for probably about a week when i read it on the train because <laughs> i was like yeah i get to read a bit more like yeah. as sports psychology books go it is absolutely blooming brilliant oh, oh that's really yes. nice of you to say that we always worry, you know, you worry when you're writing it because it's also there's, there's our personalities in there. And that's partly the sort of irreverent, our reverent take on lots of the topics and our use of, you know, as a taboo language at times. And that we did. And it was a heart. We tried to convince our publisher, Velo Press, to do that. And, and we, we stuck to our guns. And we uh, one of the things that we really uh, defend strongly is that, you know, use of, for example, use of swearing it it's used gratuitously or just to make the point then it becomes just a little rhetorical trick right but we wanted to emphasize use it in a way that we could sort of empathize a little bit more with the athlete experience that things are frustrating and difficult at times or why is it that my head always does this to me or says this to me and why have I got that little voice and so on so we tried we hope that we've got that balance right we won't have it for all people some people are you know, they don't like that style or it's too informal or a little bit cursory or whatever. So, but we, it, we wanted to stay true to who we are and, and we've done that. And then you just, you know, you put it out into the universe. You hope that there are people who it connects with too. And we've been really um, lucky uh, to hear that it has connected. Just to put you on the spot, but as you know, this is, this is your background, you're trained in this. Um, can you explain the chimp, the professor, the computer, for people that might not have heard about it and maybe don't have time to read the whole book or, or sit and yeah. listen to us for hours? Well, it, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a longer discussion, but I'll try and, you know, very, very briefly uh, to say that, you know, um, most of our mental anguish in life, not just sport, but any anything that we are have some hesitation nervousness or anxiety about that could be you know new jobs new relationships work stress whatever sport represent a fundamental fight in our heads between opposing forces and those opposing forces come from quite different places in our brain we simp the science we have to simplify a little bit there because that's, that's like you know not strictly true that um uh, but but in essence uh, your limbic system the center of your brain which is the oldest one of the oldest parts of our brain which is responsible for emotions the fight or flight response fear uh, and all those other things um, doesn't think rationally doesn't actually think at all when you think who you are that's not that part of our brain doing the thing it's an emotional reacting machine and we call it and not we didn't coin this dr steve peters the forensic psychiatrist uh, and sports psychologist in britain i coined the term chin but lots of authors have given that name the, the lizard brain the reptilian brain system one whatever so that we like it as we call it a chimp because it is like a, a, a primate that is prone to tantrums and it just throws its toys out the pram when it thinks that it's that you're putting it in situations where your life is at risk. It doesn't know that you're just, we're now living fairly, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, mundane lives in the suburbs, but um, it thinks that you're generally going to be eaten by something big. Um, uh, or that it's worried that you're going to be humiliated, embarrassed, or shown to be inadequate in front of other people. And that, again, is historic from an evolutionary perspective. That often did mean, mean that you were isolated from a tribe, forage food for yourselves, defend yourselves. That obviously did mean death. That often did mean death. But now we, we're overcome with these emotions that drive us to say, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Your life's at risk, your life's in danger, or you're going to be embarrassed or humiliated. So that's one side of that fight. And the other side, to simplify it, is from your rational thinking, you, the wrinkly frontal cortex, what we call the professor brain, that only uses facts and logic. And your professor brain is saying, well, well, hang on a minute, it's only a triathlon, it's only a running race. Well, stop getting so nervous. Why are you getting so nervous about it? Um, or it's only a job, or it's only... And yet, and so we find ourselves fighting between the two. Unfortunately, the chimp brain almost always wins unless you've learned how to manage it because it's been given certain powers to make sure that it always wins and that's a good for good reason because it's helping us stay alive so one for example is that it processes information from our senses our ears and our eyes and so on five times quicker than your professor brain so it's already got a head start on sending out a, a cascade of hormone reactions and neurotransmitter changes to make you primed and ready to fight or run or hide or so on so it's already quicker than we can really catch up with and then the other thing is that when you are in a stressful situation it, it dumps a chemical brick at our professor to stop it even thinking of to stop it thinking trying to think our way out of life and death situations so about 30 neurotransmitters get released that make even our executive function our decision making our attention all these little things happen to it so that we can't ultimately say well is that is that a gun that the person's holding or is it a pen let's go and find out let's use facts and logic to determine whether our lives are actually in danger that's not a good survival strategy so so in general, we've got these two fights. And so the goal in racing and training, whether whether you're in getting off the couch and doing your first 5K or trying to make your living out of it, comes to managing the, your chimp. And we're not, we don't try and like, we don't want to get rid of our chimps. Uh, we'd be useless without them. Uh, we don't want to get rid of our rational thinking brain. We'd be, we'd be in jail without that. So we want to try and manage it to work, make the chimp work for us occasionally. In, in Leslie's case, for her Paddy McGinty, which is very kind of a chimp focused strategy, it's aggressiveness, it's fight, it's refusal to back down. Um, but also know that when it's appropriate to bring out your professor and, and, and sort of talk your chimp off the ledge. And so, so all the strategies that we use in our book are really designed to, to, to manage that fight. In fact, not just in our book. I mean, if you look at mainstream psychotherapy, if you look at the cornerstone of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a most popular form of, uh, of, of psychotherapeutic interventions that counselors use, they're all based really, if you look at it, on trying to win that fight too or manage that fight too. So we've just tried to take a a, a, a metaphor um, and then use examples and use a language that makes them easy to understand so that you can say, listen, what's the goal? I want to have fewer thoughts and feelings that I don't want. And that, whether you're an athlete or a worker or a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, th those are the, that, that represents the ultimate challenge for all of us. I want to have more thoughts and feelings I want and fewer of those that I don't want. So how do I do that? And that's really what our book is trying to help people do in a sporting context. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Leslie, the, the chapter on exercise dependence is really, really interesting. Do you think that there's a difference at all between exercise dependency for pros and for age groupers, or do you think it just is almost like once you get into the sort of the hamster wheel of triathlon, then then it can affect everybody? Yeah, I think it ultimately affects everybody. Uh, obviously, as a professional, you have almost like a, a, a crutch or an excuse to fuel your, your dependency in so much as it's your job, right? So, um, and that's where the balance comes in between um, a performance and then, and then the dependency. So, and that's the hardest thing I find, right? Because it, you walk that fine balance. So, certainly as you're coming into bigger races or... You know, um, uh, uh, you know, you're 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 trying to reach targets. It's focusing purely on performance, and with that comes recovery, right? So, in doing the right thing and making the right choices, and I certainly haven't done that in the past. Um, and there's no one really policing you on that as much. Whereas, if you're a age group or you know amateur athlete, of course, you know you have your family and your friends around you that at least kind of 
give you a sense of what is ridiculous and what is right. Um, uh, putting things in perspective and, and, and making sure that you're making better decisions. Um, but we definitely have a lot of athletes, whether it's they're going to an injury or you know they're having a relationship issue, or family problems, or business problems because of the sheer amount of time they're putting into training. Um, you know, it becomes really, really challenging. So the rubber hits the road when you're forced to take time off, <laughs> and that's when you truly learn about what's kind of important in your world and what isn't so we go through this with with all of our athletes and you know I think a lot of that dependency um for certainly most of our women and, and certainly some of the men as well is, is linked to body image um because you know we're constantly running around in lycra a lot of people get into sport to lose the weight and so um you know you you are able to enjoy more foods when you're training and exercising so when you no longer have any of that uh, it's a, it's a real challenge for athletes. You know, they put weight on. Uh, you know, they start to feel fat. All of those things. So, um, certainly for us as coaches, it's trying to assess what level of dependency they have, um, and seeing at what point that sort of goes over that balance. And um, because at the end of the day, you know, hey, there's worse things to be quote unquote addicted to. A lot of people, uh, you know, certainly people that get into the sport have addictive personalities, and so they're 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 using this as their form of therapy so you don't want to suddenly just take that away from them it's just understanding at what point it's to a de- detriment to their health to their wellness uh, and to those around them so it's it's just kind of making them aware of that situation isabel hansen um got in touch and said she's got a question as well she says first of all here you go the book is the best book i have read in a long time very wow. useful and not only sports related maybe you could ask a little bit about the after race depression yep she says we always work towards that day or race but once it's over i often find myself a bit lost so have you got Big any time. any thoughts on that yeah, first and foremost, it's very common. So I think one of the biggest things you can realise is that every most people go through this and that can make you feel better. Like, OK, you know, I'm not totally weird. This actually happens to everyone. But then it's about setting other goals, because the biggest thing is not having a goal in place. And it doesn't have to be a sports goal. Uh, it doesn't have to be about performance or another race. In fact, it's important to have that break at the end of a season or after a big race. But those goals might be you know, choosing another hobby. I've always wanted to learn to sing. I'm going to sign up for three singing classes in a row and I'm going to set a goal of learning a song. You know, that might be something totally random. Or I've always wanted to get into yoga or Pilates, but I've never prioritised that in my triathlon world because I'm always too busy trying to rack up miles. I'm going to join a yoga practice for a month. I'm going to do some meditation and yoga. So I think it's just very important that we live very, very structured lives as triathletes. And that's what we love about it. So find that structure in another thing. And it's the same when you're injured. You need to set up your life to support that level of structure that keeps you sane and keeps you enjoying uh, what it is that you do. So for me, I actually have a whole other world in film and in screenplay writing. Um, So that's what I do after a big race. And that really gets me excited and fired up. And it gives me new different goals. And it stops that depression from sinking. And we've actually learned quite a lot about the neurobiology of the sort of the roller coaster that comes with achievement or goals that we set that are quite lofty, big or difficult. And then what happens to us brain from a brain chemistry perspective afterwards. So we do know that, for example, one one small little finding is that um, something called anticipatory reward, that dopamine, the sort of a feel good uh, a neurotransmitter in our brain. Yeah, it is is we're getting squirted on by it metaphorically speaking and um, when we think about something exciting coming up and that exciting thing could be scary exciting like a race it could be just be purely pleasurable but it's so we, we we're the dopamine uh, mechanics are running in our head as to make us feel ready and ready and look forward to it look forward to, look, and look forward to it and when we actually do it sometimes the dope the spike in dopamine is actually lower doing receiving or getting the reward like doing the race or finishing the race then it as it actually is looking forward to it and so 
it, we often feel a sense of a bit of a letdown or an anticlimax or something because of that. And and so when our, when we're sort of hijacking our dopaminergic systems, as we say, and we're putting it on this constant sort of uh, build, 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 crescendo, flop, build, 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 crescendo, flop, it sort of creates... Um, we get withdrawal symptoms from that. And so symptoms are just feeling, not even depression, but just feeling down or blue or just not being able to enjoy things that have previously been enjoyable seem to crop up. And we get them on a very minute scale, even not even after a race, but before a race, when we when we uh, taper for a race, when we suddenly cut down our training, we call it taper tantrums because your mood changes because of your brain chemistry changing in response to suddenly cutting down your training getting ready for the race itself so we like to always be two races booked or, or signed up for ahead of yourself um and so the people who are most prone to this seem to be folks who are sort of the the bucket list athletes i want to get this one race done or this you know i want to be an ironman they do it and then there's no other they're not really invested into the identity of being an athlete their identity of, of achieving the, the checkbox of what they what it shows that they're an athlete so developing systems or getting a process in place of loving the training or getting enjoyment out of that protects us a little bit about a little bit against the, the, the crash that we feel after something big is now over. It's like when you come back from an amazing holiday, isn't it? You should just always book the next one. Oh, that's and then, right. Why do you, you move <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we've spoken a bit um, on, our, on, on the podcast about sometimes people sort of say, you know, I, I was pushing as hard as I could, um, but I just couldn't push any harder. So basically, the chapter on embracing the suck. I think you've probably got a few bits of of good advice in there that that might be useful. Yeah, I think that you can only truly learn to push to the edge if you do it frequently, right? We know that, that, that it changes our actual brain chemistry. It's called neuroplasticity. We actually change the constitution of our brain when we deal with um, adversity. So, you know, you want to be putting yourself in situations of adversity frequently so that you know you can deal with it come race day. So, you know, I certainly do that in training. I create, you know, really hard workouts where I'm supposed to fail so I know what it's like to push myself to the brink or very, very close to it. So I build the resilience mentally and I, I come up with the tools to do so. Um, and then when you're in a race, you kind of know what happens when that's the case. I think a lot of people often don't maybe train as hard or don't put themselves in those situations. So when they do get to a race and those things arise, they can't deal with it. They're not mentally tough enough to do it. And then when it comes down to a race, realising that um, ultimately it's, in every moment of that race, are you giving a hundred percent effort and attitude? Those are the only things that are w that, that are within your control. Uh, it's not about times. It's not about how you're beating people around you. So many of those things are out with your control. So as long as in every moment you're focusing on that effort and attitude, you can finish that race knowing that you've not thrown the towel in because at the end of the day that's the thing that frustrates us the most as athletes is that we throw the towel in and we haven't felt like we've given it everything that we can so i think it's um mindfulness training as well so being in the moment uh, and 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 effort and attitude so yeah. those are those are the biggest things and, and i think that you know to bring this full circle to the to the chimp and the professor fight um, is that when you're hurting or something's unpleasant because you're freezing cold, it's miserable and you're in pain and you just want it to be over, your chimp is saying, what the hell are you doing to me? Like, like stop this. Either you're going to die, uh, you're going to get injured, or or anything that's kind of vaguely not noxious, like it's unpleasant, uncomfortable, it wants you to stop doing it as a survival mechanism. So learning some of the strategies that we use to manage the chimp, that chimp's voice, either how loud it is or what, what you can run interference with it, is going to help. And so the third brain that we never mentioned, uh, I never mentioned with the chimp professors, with the computer brain, it's Steve Peter's language, and this is the, the brain that runs all of our automatic autopilots and habits. So when you're not thinking about anything in particular, but you're still living and going through the world that's really your computer brain working so we can run in the, the professor brain is going to be a puny match for an, a, a, an angry chimp telling you to stop 
but you've paid for this race and just get to the finish. But meanwhile, your chimp is screaming at you. It's, it's a fight you're never going to win. But your computer brain, which is actually even quicker than both brains, can win that fight for you. So we get it to do things like count over and over again to six or to eight. Uh, it sounds silly to sing a song chorus in your head. Something that doesn't has a low cognitive load, doesn't require your professor to actually do it. Um, but it still is still running into fit, but is taking up bandwidth in sort of mindset terms so that your chick can crowd out the noise of your chimps. And so that's why when you look at this, the pain tolerance literature in psychology, some of the best strategies are counting, are, are using sort of uh, imagery, are using uh, re uh, reciting lyrics to songs or visualizing colors or shapes and so on. So it's getting invoking that sort of automatic brain uh, a computer brain to sort of pick up the charge and, and to counter it. So that, that, those why, that's why those strategies work. And Lin Lindsay Corbin was talking that very strategy the other day. That's how she got through the marathon at Kona. She was counting to herself. So it was it was quite a complicated counting strategy, but <laughs> she did it and it worked. So yeah, yeah, it really does. And there's, there's there's a whole host of variations on that counting that really are effective. But it's very it's remarkable. It seems remarkably simple, but it's actually quite complex at the sort of a neurological level why it's working and it does work that's awesome so honestly go and check out the brave athlete calm the fuck down and rise to the occasion um it is genuinely brilliant leslie before i let you go i'm really sorry i'm gonna have to bring the tone down further um poo transplants yeah so you know basically you know having lyme disease and being on a lot of antibiotics and being an endurance athlete, which ultimately compromises your gut, uh, your microbiome, the bacteria in your gut, uh, that determines a lot of um, things that go on in your body. Uh, mine was super, super compromised. So um, I went to London and had this treatment where you essentially take someone else's microbiome from their poo um, that is really, you know, from somebody that's really healthy. I'll, I'll, in fact, I had 20 different donors um, and they insert it. What in kind of poo people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they insert it up your bum into your intestine and essentially you adopt a new microbiome. Do you feel a difference straight away? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I The biggest thing actually I noticed was my mood because we know there's a lot of links between your gut microbiome and your brain. So mm. a lot of people that suffer from depression and anxiety actually have a lot of gut issues. So I was certainly dealing with a lot of that. And, uh, you know, as soon as I had the FMT, actually, I, I definitely noticed a big improvement in my mood. And then she wanted to be called Larry, a 52-year-old accountant from Luton, which was a bit strange. Did you know anything about your poo donors? Uh, no. no, no, but I do know they're very well vetted and they have a lot of uh, testing and all that kind of stuff. Apparently most of them or many of them come from firefighting and they apparently have co close to cast iron intestinal uh, and intestine so and gut. So yeah, many, many of them. <laughs> Um, and final question, uh, Leslie, uh, we've done poo. Uh, what are you working on screenwriting production wise at the moment? Yeah, so I'm working on a, a new one with my husband set in Ireland. Uh, we have an Irish director and it's actually about the travellers community in Ireland. Um, so it's about bare knuckle, uh, bare knuckle fighting in that community and we have a female lead protagonist, go figure, right? And, uh, you know, uh, so, that, so that's one we're working on. Then we're working on another uh, sports-based movie about gene doping and, and uh, a thriller, a kind of a, a political sports thriller. So we've got a few on the go at the minute, actually. And then, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've had a big one for a while that we've been trying to get off the ground. Uh, based, uh, we have the rights to the novel All Quiet on the Western Front. So it's a World War, World War I film. So we kind of have a lot of a lot of in the fire so hopefully hopefully something's going to come off uh, here in the in, in the just you know near future i was going to say how, how far off like would they be oh how yeah how long is a piece how long is a piece of string yeah it's it's one of those things where you know hopefully soon but it, it's an odd industry let's just put it like that <laughs> you're probably glad that you don't do you don't do it full time and you have your coaching and your triathlon and big time i mean I, i'd love to get to the point where it is full time that's a huge passion of ours is for to move into that arena but you really have to set up your life to support yourself in other ways first and then develop that career it's like when you're a professional right most professionals will be working full time and training full time at the same you know then they get good enough to maybe just work part time then they get good enough to you know train full time it's sort of the same with screenwriting 
you you guys have a very fascinating life um thank you so much for your time and um yeah good luck uh, with the stand up paddleboard cable tossing in january <laughs> thank thanks helen guys. so much thanks, helen. Absolutely fascinating chat. Thank you very much to Leslie and Simon. And again, you can go and check out their book, The Brave Athlete, Calm the F Down and Rise to the Occasion. Um, you can go and search for it online. Yeah, I'm going to go and check there. It sounds brilliant. It's really, really good. Really good. And it's great when you hear it, it's one thing to write these things down and have theories, but then to translate them into how it affects a multiple world champion. I think that's the proof of the pudding, isn't it? Oh, yeah. De- definitely and it's almost like you're not alone you know as she said dur- during the interview about things like post-race blues first of all recognize that it does happen to everybody yeah and like literally everybody <laughs> we're not yeah, just saying so... that literally everybody yeah yeah and and so if you can prepare for that sort of thing or it with some of these things if you know that you're not the only one having these thoughts well that's already helpful to know that you know you're not a weirdo um and then yeah they give you actual practical sort of tips practical advice about how then you can almost train your brain which we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast but it's it's just really simple language that they use like you can understand it in a very yeah unique way i think I think there's this movement at the moment amongst people to try and be more honest and more genuine. And I was listening to a podcast earlier on today with, you know, Tony Robbins, the American motivational speaker guy, yeah. who, who's always like prided himself on being like, I'm the most positive person. You can change your mindset. You can change your physiology. And he's done this great interview with Russell Brand, of all people, believe it or not. And Russell Brand is really good at like going back to him and saying, so do you feel like this all the time? Because I've always suspected, like, you know, the minute the lights and the camera go off, does Tony mm. Robbins sit down and get depressed and feel tired and low energy? Because he's always projected this. You can change yourself, man, to be awesome all the time. And he kind of opens up and goes, no, there's definitely times when I come off stage and I'm really deflated and in a low energy state. And I think I think that's a real important thing for someone like him to say, because it's really easy Firstly, you can watch him and be inspired by him. But the flip side of it is if you're feeling down, you watch someone like that and go, I'm just such a failure as a human being. Look how he's positive all the time. You know, the more examples you hear of of other people working themselves out of problems, you realize everybody's working themselves out of problems all the time. That's what's important in it. Not the, the, the problem free life, but how you deal with it. Right. Yeah. And and. Yeah we've we've mentioned the words and many people have social media before and the fact that it is just such a fake world a lot of a lot of it is fake isn't it so then when someone you know it's, it's like when you see that photo and you just see this perfect photo but then when you see the wider version of it and you know the the perfect looking bedroom or, or whatever is actually a complete mess in the bit that you don't see um it's, exactly. It's it's, yeah. it's it's designed. The whole thing is designed around giving everyone a little dopamine hit to think, oh, I could look at something and it'll briefly make me feel better. Yeah, it's uh, oh, we could get onto this. Hells. Couldn't Should we? we not? Should let's, we move let's on? not. Let's not dig into <laughs> this right now. Let's stay on the positive path. <laughs> I like the fact that you picked up on the dopamine, which was mentioned in the interview, though. So, you know, we, you know. we're there. I'm right. Listening. Coach's couch then, Rob. Yeah, so we've had a question from Lee Jordan in the Oxygen Addict, um, the Oxygen Addict community Facebook group. And I wanted this one read out because it's something that so many people seem to be going through at the moment. And I think it will also form like a perennial question for people at any time of year. Definitely. So he says, I've caught two colds in a four week period and both times right before the long weekend sessions, causing training disruption with missed sessions. Should I be worried that I am missing training days at this stage? And again, the reason I wanted to highlight this was even in my private Facebook group, I was saying to you before, wasn't I? I reckon probably quarter of the comments that came back from the weekly review last week were people saying, I've got a cold, I feel sick, I feel really bad because I've got loads of reds on my Training Peaks account because I've not managed to do anything this week because I've not been well. So I really wanted to highlight this thing and, and say again to people, look, you've got to give yourself this break. One of the problems with having a training plan laid out in front of you is 
it's great for giving you some structure, but it's terrible for your mind at a time when you can't do it simply because you're not well. So in answer to Lee's question, firstly, no, you shouldn't be worried that you're missing any training days when you're not well because you can't get fit when you need to get healthy. You can only do one thing at a time. So your entire priority has got to shift away from a mindset of I've got to get these training sessions done and it's got to shift towards what can I do to support my health and get back to being healthy? And training is not going to do that. You can make the argument that you can sit on a static bike and spin at a really, really easy intensity when you're at the very end of your illness. But almost any training is a terrible idea when you're not well. So you have to give yourself that break and go, this is what the coach would tell me to do to my face if I was turning up for a session and I had, I had a cold and I was sneezing and I had the flu. A good coach will send you home and say, no, you're not training today. There's no gold stars for pushing yourself through it when you're not ill. You're just going to end up ill for an even longer period of time. So give yourself that break. Have a rest and recovery. Spend some extra time in bed getting extra sleep. You can talk about vitamins and all of that stuff, but the key parts of it are getting extra sleep and just taking care of what you eat. And everything else is going to fall into place. Your body will take as long as it takes to get well again. And then you can ease back into training. But no training plan is ever going to survive first contact with an athlete. It's going to get changed on a day by day basis. So don't ever worry about having this perfect plan because it never happens for any people that ever get one. So there you go. Stay calmly. Yeah. You're going to get through it. And 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 Rob, how many times have we mentioned the word consistency on this podcast? Mm. Mm. So actually, yeah. if by taking a couple of days rest enables you to maintain that consistency throughout the bigger picture, the bigger part of the season, then that's what you're after. I'm going to quote my gran again. She always used to say it's the right time of year to get sick because then you won't get sick in the summer. Now, that's based on absolutely no science, but <laughs> the science of my nan. Right. No one is going to argue any university professor, you can't argue with a nan, right? So if you get sick now, you've just got to tell yourself you're going to be immunized against every bug in the world when you need that consistent block of training running up to your race. So chill, chill out, Lee. It's all going to be fine. Rob, talking of your nan. Yes. Brings us nicely on to uh, Fueled by More Cake because Lovely she's nan. in it. Lovely Nan's date and walnut loaf. She's immortalised in that book, isn't she? And I tell you what, that's a blooming great cake as well. That, <laughs> yes, it is. That is the, the queen of cakes, I'm telling you. If anyone's got the book and not made that one, fill your boots. That is the best riding cake or after riding cake ever made. <laughs> um, Robert, <laughs> that's worth it? the price of admission alone. Tell me, give me the update because we had a challenge last week. I'd forgotten. The challenge was we wanted to sell 10 copies in the week, right? Yeah. Did we make yep. it? So with a day to go, I was a bit like, oh, I've only sold six. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Then some magic, magic happened, right? Yeah. We're up to 30. 30 bucks. You sold 24 in a day. Y- yeah. Love it. Yes. I took today, I took 22 books to the post office with me. It was quite a heavy bag. But it and was. I did get a few death stares in the queue. <laughs> yeah. The um, the cashiers on my right and on my left both served three customers each whilst I was still, yeah. Oh, you can't be held with responsible my cashier. For, the, she was... for the slowness of a cashier, Hells. It's all good. She wasn't slow. She was on it. It's just the sheer number of books that <laughs> and stickers that she, she had to put on. Obviously, 20 stickers. Yeah. The whole thing. We need to get one of those little machines you can have yourself, don't we? And print them in your room. Oh. It's not a bad idea, yeah, actually. Okay. We'll have those in place for Fuel by Cake 3. How about that? Oh, it's not happening. It's not happening. Well, people better buy Fuel by Cake 2 because I saw in the Facebook group someone was asking whether they could buy a copy of the original, and that's gone and it's not available anymore. So if anybody wants one, they need to get on it now. Hell's new target. This week, we set a target of 10 last week and sold 30. I'm setting a target of 20 this week. It's going to be the last target week before Christmas. It's going to be people's last chance to get it in for a potential Christmas present for themselves. So 20 copies need to be sold by the end of the week, please, listeners. Come on, get on it. Cake for your tummies. 
<laughs> Thanks. No, honestly, it's been it has been absolutely. I feel, I just feel very overwhelmed by everyone's support. It's amazing. It's cool, it really it? is. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, seriously, so 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 much. It's kind of a crazy. It's very much a, a crazy target, um, and it really would not be possible without everyone's help. So yeah, as a kind of as a bit of a community, you are all helping to raise fifteen thousand pounds for my local hospice, Melanoma UK, and Young Epilepsy. And yeah, I am really touched. So thank you. And that's great. And before I cry, I'm going to bring some humour and say they're only doing it because they want cakes, Hells. <laughs> they're getting cake out of it. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> some some money gets raised for charity and they get cake. What's not to love? It's all good. I know. I know. I know. Someone stuff. said that they are addicted to the ginger and cashew squares in there. Oh, nice. Yep. Always good to bring a bit of addiction to something. God, I know I'm probably anyway, let's not let's not go there. Let's not go back to a dear Fiona <laughs> it's, and how it's, dare I it's all good. It's if you, if you can have a little cakes. a little treat at Christmas, get some cake inside you when you ride. It's why we do it. All right, a few more bits of news then before we wrap this up. So the first one comes from Lucy Gossage, who looks like she had not just a storming race, but an amazing experience out in Patagon Man. Yeah, have you read her blog? I haven't yet, but I saw some of the photos that were posted up on Slow Twitch. It looked amazing. Oh, well, it's a really, really good blog. So if you haven't read it, go and uh, read it. She talks about the race and she also, Rob, does say, I won't be calling myself a professional triathlete in 2019. Really? Yeah. Now, does that mean she won't be calling herself one, but she'll still go and win four pro races like she has done this year or is that it she's not registering as a pro and she's not racing she says this time last year i tweeted that patagon man would be a great retirement race and i stand by this i won't be calling myself a professional triathlete in 2019 but you will still see me on some start lines of some crazy challenges doing events that capture my imagination take me to cool places and take me out of my comfort zone. If anything, Patagon Man has reinvigorated my lust for adventure, and who knows where that will take me. Oh, I love it. Good for her. Isn't that brilliant? Lucy rolls off into the sunset looking for adventure. Yeah. That's the way to go. She should do Triathlon X next year. She'd love that. Well, you, you never know. You never but it know. won't be won't be as a professional triathlete. Be as a pro. Cool stuff. And one little bit of news to finish off the week, I guess. It's yes. A bit um, of congratulations, isn't it? Yeah. So Lucy Charles and Reese Barkley tied the knot at the uh, at the weekend. So congratulations to them both. Oh, brilliant stuff. Well done, you two. Congratulations. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of our show pretty much, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it does, Rob. I just wanted to say uh, one thing. Um, we've been finding out on um, on Twitter, actually, people's favourite Christmas workouts, because this time of year, oh, yeah. it's, a, Go on. it's a good time to be doing it. So uh, just a few of them. Um, the, the gang at Belvoir Try, uh, they do like a, a 12 days of Christmas activity for their for their club. So they've got different things going on. Um <laughs> Matthew Cox says, run, walk home for Christmas, 12 miles with the dog to my parents last year with plenty of mince pie and sherry stops. Neil Love Crump that. sent us the 12 days of Christmas all packed into one 5K swim set. Um, and he's going to be doing that on January the 2nd. Joe Spraggins, you might have heard him on the show. He said, Christmas morning marathon. What? Always set you up nicely for five desserts after dinner. I don't think wow. there's a need to go and do a marathon on Christmas Day morning. Um, and then <laughs> That's how you get to all... win your age group at Ironman UK, isn't it? Good lad. Maybe. maybe. Uh, George Bright sent me a, um, a really crazy 12 days of Christmas um, running workout. Ed Saunders said hill reps in a Santa hat. Uh, Trevor Jones said a new swimming technique. It's called the pub crawl. Uh, nice one. And, uh, and that was that was That's about terrible. it. 50 press-ups. I like this one. John Elliott, 50 press-ups every time you hear Slade. Oh, that's going to hurt, isn't it? Yeah, that'd be awful. And yeah, Fiona said there's an event here each year to do a 
100 hundreds in the pool for Christmas. I'll pass, thanks. Oof. Love it. Some good Christmas training going on. It's good, isn't it? It is. Christmas Day training is good. I like it. I like to get out for a little run on Christmas Day. It's an old family tradition. My dad used to pack me into my running shoes and we'd run up to see my grand three miles away and run back again with Christmas Santa hats on. And uh, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, I like that. We're going to be doing a, a run on Boxing Day. Oh, yeah, you had Chester. Chester around the walls, Ray. Nice. Yeah. Can't wait. It's always a classic. Yeah. yeah. And um, my my brother, actually, is also going to be doing it, Rob. And I think this tells you a bit about the crazy gene in our family. So the race, I don't know, let's say it starts at half eight, nine, half nine, whatever it is. Um, they are landing from Australia at 6.30 in the morning on Boxing Day in Manchester. And they're going to be coming to run. Straight to the race. Yeah. Magnificent. <laughs> it's easy Strong to see where the, where the bonkers endurance genes come from in that family, hasn't it? <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. So there we go. That'll be, that'll be fun. Uh, Dave, Dave Graham said mint pie miles, which basically involves you doing lots of miles, walking, swimming, biking, running, uh, and then eating lots of mint pies. And uh, Matt said run over the South Downs or a bike and coffee ride in the beautiful East Sussex countryside. Very nice. It's all good, Hells. It's all good. All right, well, we're going to wrap the show up here then. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week. Um, until then... I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Till then, have a great, safe Christmas training and racing week, and we'll talk to you again next week. Cheers, everybody. Bye now. Bye.